Well, a few years ago, I was at the funeral of a man that had died suddenly. And I remember uh, walking into the church that it was at, and you walk in, and there are pews, and everybody's sitting in there, and there's a certain level of order. You know what I'm talking about? We've all experienced a funeral, I'm sure. And there's a certain level of order in the way that things are done. The family sits at the front, and uh, people would get up and would speak and do their thing. And afterwards, I remember uh, talking to this man's widow, and I remember her saying to me, I'm so sorry, I just, uh, I, can't, I can't keep it together. It's, it's been a really rough day for me. And I remember thinking, wait, at what point did this become something that you should be sorry for? Like, at what point did you feel obligated to apologize for this? And the thing is, as I've actually experienced this more than once, this is a common thing, and I'm sure you have experienced this also. What it makes me wonder is, when did we as a society forget how to move through grief? I uh, have another friend whose uh, sister uh, lives in Sri Lanka, and uh, well, they're from Sri Lanka, and her sister still lives there. And she is what I like to call a competitive crier. And what happens is when someone dies, they go and they hire this individual to come and be a part of the funeral processional. And this person will come and they cry with the family and with everybody else because the more criers that you have at your funeral, the better your funeral is. Which I don't know why this matters to the person that's already passed, but... <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> but as you can tell, it's competitive. So what happens is everybody gets together and they cry, and she's a very good crier, so incidentally, she gets hired a lot. And uh, th this type of thing actually happens in a lot of other places in the world. It doesn't really happen in North America, but I'm sure that we've all turned on the TV and seen someone in some other country that dies, and we will see, sometimes they'll take the body and they'll just carry it through the streets, right? They'll take a body and they'll be carrying this body of this person that's a great leader or that's whatever, whoever it may be, and they'll be carrying this person through the streets. People will be throwing themselves in the body. And I'm sure that you, like me, all of us have at some point seen this and thought, that's a little bit crazy, pull yourself together. Have a little bit of class, <laughs> right? But I would actually argue that this is a much more natural and healthy way to move through grief. The thing is, is that many times what we do is we medicate instead of mitigate. And when you say the word medicate, probably one of the first things that comes to mind is medicine. Are you with me? All right? You think medicine. You think, well, there's a pill for this. My arm hurts. Okay, we have a pill for that. Um, the thing is, is many times when we experience grief or we experience suffering or we experience something that is uncomfortable, we simply turn to medicating instead of mitigating. There's always a pill. There's always a drink. There's always some type of food. There's always a person. There's always some form of entertainment. There's always some type of religious service you can go to. You know what I'm talking about, right? It's easy to just gloss over it instead of mitigating, whereas mitigating is when you actually hold this thing that has happened in your hand and you say, what do I do with it? How do I move through it? And you move through it. And you hopefully have a community of people that can move through it with you. And you actually assess the damage and you move through it, as opposed to, well, we'll just gloss over it. We're just gonna try and move th through it. We're just gonna, gonna try and keep ourselves together like this woman at this funeral. I'm so sorry, I can't keep it together. I, uh, I have a friend that says, sometimes, she says, sometimes I wonder if we suffer from too much of a good thing. And uh, it makes me think about this thing that Viktor Frankl said, the great Viktor Frankl. And one of the things that he says is that between stimulus and response, there is this space. And in that space is our power to choose our response. 
And in our response lies our growth and our freedom. Anybody here want to experience a little bit of freedom? Anybody here want to experience a little bit of growth when you're going through something incredibly painful? Anybody here want to experience having someone that just says, yeah, that's terrible when you're going through something incredibly terrible? This creating of space that every single one of us, I believe, is called to and can do and has the opportunity to do, I think is best exemplified by a story that I heard about the Iroquois uh, nation. And there's this book uh, written by Sebastian Junger, and he talks about it. It's actually by the same uh, name of my talk, which is Tribe. And <clears throat> it's this story. And the what would happen is the Iroquois nation all the different tribes that were part of this nation, when they would have warriors that they would send off to war, they would gather together and they would do this whole ceremony and they would go through and do this whole thing before they sent off their warriors. And here's the thing, is it wasn't just the warriors and it wasn't just the warriors' families, but every single person in the tribe that would participate in this. And then when they would come back, th and those that, well, those that would come back would participate in this same thing again this exact same ceremony. And they did this because they had this fundamental understanding that everything that had happened, everything that they had experienced also affected the rest of the tribe. That everything that had affected the tribe had also affected them. That there was this unity. That this whole thing that had happened had affected them together as a tribe. And so they would go through it. And what's so crazy is that uh, there are actually uh, papers that have been written on this and uh, studies that have been done. Th these tribes actually experienced uh, far less cases of PTSD, in some cases none, from battle. And uh, mental health issues were quite low. And uh, people had better community. The inverse of this is uh, <laughs> is a story about a friend of mine. I like to call nasty neighbors because I think we all have that neighbor that talks too much. You know what I'm talking about? That person that you're outside, you're gardening, you want it to be quiet, and this person always somehow seems to be outside when you come outside <laughs> and wants to talk to you about, my goodness, who knows what, <laughs> and you just want to work on the petunias two of you here that actually work on your garden. So this friend of mine, he's telling me one day, he says, yeah, my neighbor uh, was talking to me the other day, and he, says, he tells me uh, his neighbor came up to him and said, I, uh, I just found out that my wife has been cheating on me. She's been having an affair. And I don't know what to do. And he kind of has this, like, brush it off, like, yeah, okay, <laughs> right? <laughs> and when he's telling me this story, he tells me, he says, uh, he says, I thought, why the hell are you sharing your crap with me? I got enough of my own crap. <laughs> and here's the thing. I totally get discretion. I totally get timing, right? There's a timing for these things. And there's also a time, there's a place, too, Right? But here's the thing, I would say that this, what this neighbor did was a bid. This was him saying, I don't know how to move through this incredibly painful experience. And I just want someone to say, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is painful. Or someone to say, yeah, my sister went through a divorce. Yeah. Or even, I can't imagine what you're going through. Is there anything I can do? Changes the whole story. It changes the whole story. I would argue that we function much more as a society, and society tends to function in a way that views us as this one big kind of thing. I wouldn't even say organism because really it's just society. Do you ever hear that people say things like, oh yeah, well, nobody likes that. 
Like people say, like, what's something? Okay, like Justin Bieber. You ever hear people that are like, yeah, nobody likes Justin Bieber. And I'm like, well, he's selling out. So obviously somebody likes him. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> obviously somebody somewhere, if not just a few people. Okay. Here's the thing. A tribe functions in this way. A tribe functions in a way that is something has affected me and it also affects you. Something has affected all of us and it's also affected each and every one of us. And I would say that if we could learn to say me too, just say me too when we can. Don't lie because that's not good. <laughs> but if we could say me too in these moments, that we would have stronger, greater communities, that we actually might have communities with greater forgiveness, greater loving, greater healing. Anybody here feel like they could use a little bit of healing? Some more grace? That if we could simply do this, this might be one of the keys to greater community entering into the suffering of others simply by trying to say, me too. Thank you.